Hey Optimancers, Chris here. For the past few months I've been pouring through Tash's cauldron of everything in detail and I've been analyzing each portion. Today I'm going to go through the optional class features for the Rogue class and I'm going to go through the new Phantom Roguish Archetype. In my next video I'm going to be reviewing the Soul Knife Archetype. Before we dive in, some of the fans of this channel have decided to support my work through Patreon. If you would like to support this channel, a link is available in the video description. Get rewards like ad-free video access or join me for a role-playing session each month. Today, I want to recognize some of my top supporters, Geek Dice, Jay Gamble, Joseph Robodeau, and Steven Edmondson. Thank you for your support. So, let's get started. So when it comes to optional class features, the Rogue didn't get very many. Uh, they only get one, in fact. Steady Aim is available at third level, and it allows you to use your bonus action to get advantage on your next attack that turn. Using Steady Aim requires you not move on your turn beforehand, and sets your speed to zero for the remainder of the turn. Now I should mention that not moving and having a speed of zero are two very different things. If you are flying and you don't have a hover speed, you can choose not to move, and that's not a problem. But if your speed is set to zero, you actually fall. So there is that to think about if you do end up flying with your rogue. Now I've said on this channel before that, as a rogue, it's not hard to set up sneak attack when you make your attack. This can be done simply by attacking the same target that your melee allies are attacking, or by using cutting action to hide before you make an attack. It is the latter of these that I would expect steady aim to take the place of, and in most cases I would expect this to occur with a ranged attack. Mechanically this is going to end up being similar to using cutting action to hide and then revealing yourself with an attack with advantage. There are two primary differences. The first is that this option is guaranteed to work. In the case of hiding, there is sometimes the chance that the hide check will not be successful. I say sometimes because it's not uncommon for the rogue to be good enough at stealth that they have no chance to fail this role. The second difference is this option provides no ability to use movement on your turn, which is why I say this is more likely to be used with a ranged attack, because if you are doing a melee attack, unless you're already in position at the start of your turn, you're not going to be able to use this ability. But despite being mechanically similar to the cutting action hide and reveal combination, the nice thing about this option is we don't need to wade into the vague rules on using stealth to hide in combat. The rules on using stealth and hiding are so misunderstood that I have watched multiple YouTube videos attempting to explain the mechanics since the release of 5th edition and had stealth explained in very different ways in these videos. Can you hide in the same place twice? Can you hide if the creature you are hiding from knows where you are? Do you need for them to be distracted? What counts as being distracted? Can you hide behind another creature if you're not a lightfoot halfling? Yes, I saw a YouTube video on how stealth works in D&D, explaining the rules, and they explain that any small sized creature could hide behind a medium or large creature, and no, I'm not going to call out their channel. Can you hide if they can't see you clearly? Can you hide if they have true sight? If they have blind sight? If they have blind sense? If they have tremor sense? If you have to move out of hiding in order to be able to attack, do you still get advantage? I've seen so many different interpretations of these variables that an option to just get advantage and skip this minefield entirely is welcome indeed. So the value of this depends greatly on the table. If a DM is liberal with their rules of hiding, then this might not do that much for you. But if a DM is going to make hiding difficult regardless of your stealth skill, then this can be your go-to way to get advantage. So as far as this feature goes, as a DM, I would definitely allow this, and I would recommend it to be allowed at any table. And at a minimum, it's going to save you some headaches dealing with the hide rules in the middle of combat. Now, I've heard many concerns that sneak attack is too powerful, and allowing it every round is simply too much. But I'll tell you, as a professional optimizer who plays with other optimizers all the time, 
and I see the plethora of builds that optimizers make, the rogue is not too powerful if they get sneak attack once per round. A rogue that does sneak attack once per round is doing damage that is reasonable, but not nearly the highest I've seen, and the rogue is not backing that up with a particularly strong defense, or a bunch of tricks like spellcasting, except in the most minor way if they're an arcane trickster, or have some other method of casting a few spells. Really, in the optimization community, we seldom see pure class rogues, and as multi-class, they show up from time to time, but not more often than most other classes do. I see warlocks, sorcerers, fighters, paladins, wizards in far more builds than I see rogues. So sneak attack is not too powerful. It's really needed for a rogue. They don't get extra attack. They can't combine the weapon they use with great weapon master or polar master. They need sneak attack in order to be effective. And if the rogue is not doing sneak attack every round, then they're not really doing much. They're not delivering offensively. They're not a defensive build. They're not a spellcaster. They're not really doing anything. So how did rogues do in Tasha's? Well, they did all right. We got two new roguish archetypes, the Phantom and the Soul Knife. Today I want to go over the Phantom Rogue. Thematically, the Phantom Rogue uses negative energy of the dead to enhance their own abilities. This might be through study of the dead, an alliance with the temple of a deity of death, or perhaps whoever provided those features chose you as a vessel. The Shatterkai Elves are specifically called out as a racial option that fits thematically with this subclass. At third level we get our first feature, which is called Whispers of the Dead. This feature allows you to gain proficiency in a skill or tool proficiency after a short or long rest, and that proficiency will last until you use the feature again and choose a new proficiency. The first feature I'm reminded of is the Knowledge Cleric's Blessing of Knowledge feature. This is a second level channel divinity option that allows the cleric to gain proficiency in a skill or tool. For the knowledge cleric, this firstly requires the use of their channel divinity, and secondly, the proficiency only lasts 10 minutes. Also, Blessing of Knowledge is the only subclass feature the knowledge cleric gets at level 2, while this is one of only two at level 3 for the phantom. The only advantage of Blessing of Knowledge over this is we may discover the need for proficiency somewhere in between our rests, and the channel divinity of the Knowledge Cleric can take advantage of that, while the Phantom feature cannot. So we can see that overall, this feature is mechanically significantly superior, as we aren't using a class resource, and we're not dealing with a short duration. A floating proficiency is also significantly superior to a simple extra proficiency as we can place it where we need it, when we need it. We may not always know what proficiency we're going to need when our rest is complete, but sometimes we can. Perhaps we just finished a battle with an enemy and decide to take a short rest. There are some strange plants in the room, and the DM requires a nature check to identify them. After our rest, we can choose the nature proficiency to have the proficiency bonus to our roll. Or, perhaps, there is a bridge we wish to cross but the DM is requiring a masonry tools check to determine if the weathered bridge is safe. Perhaps the fighter's weapon was damaged by a grey ooze, and proficiency in smith's tools will be required to repair it. Now regardless of the proficiency gained, remember that there's still an ability score tied to the check. So if you have a poor intelligence score, you are not going to become an expert at history, even if you are adding proficiency. The other feature we get at third level is Whales from the Grave. Whales from the Grave allows you to damage a second creature when you deal sneak attack damage on your turn. The damage is equal to half your sneak attack dice rounded up and it's necrotic damage. The way it's worded, it's quite clear this damage will not get doubled if the attack that triggered it is a critical hit, as it is clearly worded as a separate instance of damage rather than part of the same attack, so don't worry about saving this ability for a crit. There are a number of limitations here. The biggest is that this can only be done a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you only get the uses back after a long rest. This means twice per day when you get this ability, so that is not much. We will eventually get another way to use this feature more often, but not until ninth level. The second is that the creature must be within 30 feet of the first one. And finally, this is limited to a sneak attack on your turn 
So if you did a sneak attack with a reaction attack on another creature's turn, for example, it doesn't qualify. Generally, though, I don't think you're going to have any issues at all using this up every day of adventuring. Super easy. The issue is it's just going to run out really quickly. So each of the features gained at third level are okay at best. And getting two features at third level is standard for a rogue. Neither of these abilities are bad per se, and you will get use out of both of them. But I just don't think you're going to find either of them overly powerful. That takes us to ninth level when we get Tokens of the Departed. When a creature you can see dies within 30 feet of you, with your reaction you can cause a soul trinket to appear in your free hand. You can collect a number of soul trinkets equal to your proficiency bonus, and if you use them up, you can create more with no limitation beyond the maximum number you can possess at one time. Whenever you have at least one soul trinket in your possession, you will have advantage on death saving throws. This honestly is an ability that I would expect to have been a lot more useful if we had got it at earlier levels. Low level characters go down pretty easily and sometimes stabilizing them can be a challenge. But by ninth level I would expect player characters to be falling to zero hit points less commonly and when they do it's far more likely their allies will be able to stabilize them or even heal them before failing three death saves is even a possibility. Still, that doesn't mean this is a useless ability, as I still see important death saves come up at this level from time to time. I mean, I've seen high level characters get knocked to zero hit points while flying, take damage from falling, and then roll a natural one on a death save before any ally has a chance to heal them. It does happen. So I would say that advantage on death saves is never worthless, I just wouldn't expect it to make a significant difference that often by this level. The Soul Trinkets can be used actively in two ways. The first is that you can activate your Whales from the Grave feature without expending a use of that feature by destroying the Trinket. The second is you can use an action to destroy the Trinket and you can ask the spirit associated with the Trinket a question, which it will answer, but it's not obligated to be truthful, and that's a pretty big limitation. And afterwards, the spirit is released, whether they told you the truth or not. So there are a few things to unpack here. The first is, in order to get the trinket in the first place, you need a free hand when the creature dies. This is a pretty big limitation. If you are holding two weapons, you can't use this. If you have a weapon in one hand and a magic item in the other, you can't use this. If you have a weapon and a shield, you can't use this. Needing that free hand is something we can certainly plan for, but if you neglect to do so, not being able to use this feature is really going to suck. Also, remember to put that token away somewhere on your turn, so that hand is empty again should you get the opportunity to use this feature again. You do not want to be in a position where you want to use this feature, but you're unable to because you have one of those darn trinkets in your hand from your previous use. Again, this is something you need to consider in your character creation because your character gets one free object interaction on their turn. If that interaction is storing a trinket, then you aren't drawing a different weapon, for example. The next thing to consider is the additional uses of Whales from the Grave. When I first read this ability, I figured it was basically doubling your uses of the ability if you use your trinkets for that option exclusively. But on second reading, that's not really accurate. Your tokens don't have a duration, so you can save them over long rests, so this is a feature you don't want to forget to use whenever it's an option, as you want to have the full allotment of trinkets whenever possible. Secondly, since the uses of this feature are not limited other than the maximum you can have at one time, you can potentially gain a lot more uses of whales from the grave on a long adventuring day. So for example, let's say in the first round of combat a creature dies and you use this ability, then you put away the trinket. On your turn, you're using the trinket and you kill a second creature, thus replacing the trinket. Then on the following round, use that trinket and again replace it. Theoretically, you could use and replace a trinket every round. So at least in theory, it would be possible to gain whales from the grave every combat round of an entire day. That is a lot of extra damage. However, I don't think you should count on that. Against one really tough creature, you may not be able to create any trinkets until that creature is killed. And if that's the only encounter for the day, 
you may end up only creating one trinket over an entire day. Whenever features like this come up, I am reminded of the old bag of rats. This is a theoretical optimization trick that seems to work with more and more features these days. The idea of a bag of rats is that you carry around this bag, and when you have a feature that you can use whenever a creature dies, you kill a rat, you use the feature. This allows you more uses of the feature than the designers intended. And for that reason, this is definitely something you don't want to drop on your DM. It's just a thought experiment. But overall, this is a pretty good ability, mainly for the chance to use Whales from the Grave far more often than its original limited use. However, remember that this is firstly going to require that you have a free hand. Secondly, it's going to use up a number of object interactions. And thirdly, it's going to use up a number of reactions. And keep in mind, a rogue uses reactions for abilities like Uncanny Dodge, so this is far from free. And that brings us to 13th level and Ghost Walk. This allows us to use a bonus action to assume a spectral form. We gain a 10-foot fly speed with hover, and attacks have disadvantage against us. Also, like with incorporeal creatures, we can move through creatures and objects, but take damage if we end our turn in them. The transformation lasts for 10 minutes, and it's recovered after a long rest, but we can also use a soul trinket to use this ability again, so technically we can use this an indefinite number of times. Now a 10-foot fly speed is no big deal. I mean that's really quite slow and by 13th level we likely have a method of flight that's going to be better than that. Disadvantage on all attacks against us is really good though. That is a big defensive boost on a class that could really use some defensive boosts. It's unlikely our armor class is so great that this is going to ensure enemy misses, but it's definitely going to make them a lot more likely. Moving through creatures and objects can be really good though, even if they are difficult terrain. This vastly improves our maneuverability. We can even pop through a wall, attack, then pop back the other way. I will also note that if we do end our turn inside a creature or object, we take 1d10 force damage, which isn't that much, and this feature says nothing about being forced out of that object. So if I was fighting a dragon, for example, I might prefer taking 1d10 force damage from ending my turn in the floor than taking the dragon's breath weapon damage or a bunch of legendary attacks. So yes, this is quite a good feature, and the ability to use this multiple times through the use of soul trinkets is something I would definitely take advantage of. And this brings us to our capstone, Death's Friend. We get this at 17th level. This provides two benefits technically, though one is a lot better than the other. The first is that whenever we use Whales from the Grave, we can deliver the necrotic damage to both the first and second creature. This means that the initial creature is taking 150% sneak attack damage, and the second creature is taking 50%, so it's like double sneak attack. That's really good, and we can probably be using our Whales from the Grave feature pretty often, as we not only get six base uses at this time, but we can also have up to six soul trinkets at a time. The second is when we complete a long rest, we get a single soul trinket if we don't already have one, which isn't very much. I mean, I guess it's okay. I'll take it. So that is the Phantom. Now what I notice about this subclass is that it doesn't really come on at low levels. We basically need a 9 level investment to start really getting to the good stuff. And once we get there, the good stuff keeps coming if we continue with the subclass. So when it comes to multiclassing, if I'm not primarily a rogue, this is likely not the subclass I'm reaching for. But if I'm playing in a game that is going to high level and I'm planning to play either a straight class rogue or a build that is primarily rogue, I could see this being worthwhile. Eventually. It's actually fairly unique among rogues in this respect. I'm used to seeing the level 3 features of the rogue subclass be the primary draws. But here I see the level 9 and 13 features as the ones that really make this subclass come alive. So overall I would say this is a solid subclass, but the power progression is slower at first and builds more rapidly later on than most rogue subclasses. And as a 3 level dip, it's not the one I would go for. But if you were going 9 levels, 13 levels in rogue, it is one I would definitely consider. 
So hopefully you found that helpful. In my next video, I'll be looking over the other roguish archetype, the soul knife. So I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon.